The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. Welcome to Southside Bible Church. Grateful for any visitors who have come to worship with us. We are uh, appreciative of having you in the house of God with us to worship. Uh, sorry about the Saturday. We we're going to have that conference at my house and the gentleman who was teaching it, he, well, his wife went into labor. So Christian Hunt uh, had a little girl yesterday. And so we'd be praying for him and his sweet wife. Hallelujah. Uh, baby Brooklyn uh, is, is his little daughter's name. So hallelujah uh, for those two. Today is what is known as Father's Day, where dads are going to be celebrated all around the world. And fatherhood, I just think, is such an important role that you play in God's kingdom and His economy. And so it cannot be exaggerated, the need for biblical dads in this world, uh, spiritual dads in the faith as well. The call for the men of the church really to take this mantle and to run and to hand it to the next generation. This is the calling to dads and all of us men. Uh, so it's the same call for the women of the church in Titus 2 to hand that baton uh, to the younger ladies. And both of these, uh, mom and dads, are under attack today. I feel like I'm watching men act like women and women acting like men in our society. And the need then for role models and examples and disciples in the church is, is great. You know, where Paul says, act like men. This is a call to, to be trained and taught how to be men of God for the kingdom of God. And so I realized it's been a while since we have just uh, talked about being a pops, a dad. And so what I want to do this morning is we're going to pull out a second Peter, which is just so full with truth that I think is key to being a good dad. We were going to look at hastening and urging the coming of the Lord, and we will look at that next week, Lord willing. It's a massive pillar for being a father, the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. And living in light of those realities, is, is, that's how you will parent rightly. Anchor your kids on those two realities and you will do well. I've never met someone who understands the advents of Christ and has fought to keep them in the forefront of their thinking and their hearts that did not do a great job in parenting. The world, and even in some places in the church, tends to divide them up. And they just kind of tend to give you a list of what it means to be a dad. Here's your list, guys. Go do this if you want to be a good dad. And don't deal with the foundation stones and the principles of the kingdom that will set the, the aroma of the home. You don't do that and you will end in a sad place. When you realize that you cannot just clean up those little pigs or uh, little piggies, you know, that you just can't clean them up and that they still have the same heart and they'll just go right back into the mud. And yet, I've told them again and again, and my kids just don't listen. And so you just, that, that isn't going to work. I need something more powerful than moralism to be a Christian parent. I need something more powerful than the law. I need something more than just separatism and pulling out from the world and keeping them away from any bad influences. I need something more than just church. Here you go, youth pastor, take them. I need something more than just teaching the old Testament as Aesop's fables. I need Timothy, who it says you have known the sacred writings that can make you wise unto salvation because of your mother and grandmother. He, he looked, they taught the Old Testament as gospel. They saw Christ in it, and they trained Timothy in the gospel. They didn't look at it as just moral standards. Here's how you go live. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. It's gospel. I need a gospel that saves sinners. I need something more than just teaching my kids that the world is bad and they are good. I'm telling you, till God gives them a new heart, it's a bad heart. And the message is not you're good and the world's bad. That's not going to get it done. And so the greatest need that I see in the church is the need to repent of our righteousness. Where we come and we see that it's filthy rags before God and we cry out as Isaiah, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And so we need to begin to see that we repent of our sin and our righteousness before this God because it's a filthy rag before Him. So I need to want more than moral kids who vote conservative. I need more than kids that make a lot of money and then can take care of me when I'm older. It's not a bad idea, boys. 
girls. N Noah. I need a gospel. I need to be a theologian who understands law and grace if I'll ever be a good parent. I need to know how to tutor my kids to Jesus Christ and knows how unable I am to take that heart of stone children and puts the message that God uses to do that ever before them by word and by deed. There's the calling of a dad. So I just gave away my whole sermon. But that is what we're after this morning. May God meet us and make us fathers who reflect our true Father in heaven. And so before we pray, I, I, I go back to these two quotes in my life once a year, and I'm going to bring them back to you guys, and I just want to read one, and I'll read the other one at the end of the service. This is by a man named John Engel James, and he wrote it in the mid-1800s. And the title was The Anxiety of a Christian Father for the Spiritual Welfare of His Christian Child. He said, my dear children, <clears throat> never did I pass a more solemn or interesting moment than that in which my firstborn child was put in my arms. I'll never get over that moment. And when I felt that, I was a father. A new solicitude was then produced in my bosom, which every succeeding day was tended to confirm and strengthen. I looked up to heaven and breathed over my babe the, the petition of Abraham for his son, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee recognizing in the little helpless being which had so lately been introduced into our world, a creature born for eternity, and who when the sun has been extinguished, will still be soaring in heaven or sinking in hell. I returned to the closet then of private devotion, and solemnly dedicated the child to God who had given to me this precious child, and earnestly prayed that whatever may be his lot in the world, that he might be a partaker of true piety, and numbered with the saints in glory everlasting. And during the days of your infancy, I watched you with your sainted mother and all the fondness of a parent's heart. And we smiled upon you when you were slumbering in helpful repose. We have wept over you when in feverish state and pain. We've been the delighted spectator of your childhood sports. We've witnessed with pleasure the development of your intellectual powers. And we've often listened with somewhat of pride to the commendations put upon your person and your attainments. But amidst all, there's this one deep solicitude that took hold of our minds which nothing could ever divert it or abate it. And that was a deep anxiety for your spiritual welfare and for your religious character. You cannot doubt, my children, that your parents love you. In all your recollections, we have been a witness to this. And we have, as you know, done everything to promote your welfare. And so as far as was compatible with the object of your pleasure also. And we've never denied you a gratification which our duty and ability allowed us to impart. And if at any time we have been severe in reproof, even this was an awful form of love. We have spared no expense in your education. In short, love and intense love of which you can, can in present form no adequate conception has been the secret spring of all of our conduct toward you. And it's the strongest proof and purest effort of all our affection. And we wish you to be partakers then of true piety. Did we not cherish this anxiety? We should feel that amidst every other expression of regard, we were acting towards you a most cruel and unnatural part. Genuine love desires and seeks for the objects upon which it is fixed the greatest benefits of which they are capable. And as you have a capacity to serve, enjoy, and glorify God by true religion, how can we love you in reality if we do not covet for you this high and holy distinction? We should feel that our love had exhausted itself upon trifles, and I let go of objects of immense eternal consequences if it was not to concentrate all its prayers, desires, and efforts in your personal religion. And so I want to go to the throne of grace, because as I read those, those were the heart uh, that God has put within me uh, with every child he placed in my arms. And I pray for every dad here this morning that that would be your chief end, that that would be the burning thing uh, in your heart. So let's go to the throne of grace and ask God for this. Father, we come before you. This is solemn. Oh God, these little ones that you gave to us have eternal souls that will live forever. Oh God, I pray. I pray for the dads in this church. I pray for enabling grace. 
I pray that they would understand the target that they're shooting at. I pray they wouldn't get lost in law. Uh, They wouldn't get lost in their jobs. They wouldn't get lost in this world. Oh God, that their hearts would be given to this main thing. And Lord, I, I pray, don't let them get distracted with all the lies and objects of this world. Lord, let there be time of repentance now, even this morning, if necessary. And I pray, Lord, that by your Spirit through this Word, that you will raise up men like this. I pray for these sweet little ones sitting here this morning. God, I pray that you would raise up men to be this. These little kids, raise them up to be these kind of men. I pray for the little girls, that they would be raised up to be those kind of moms. God, pour out grace. Let us be reminded again of the battle that we're in. Let us join hearts and hands and be done with lesser things. Oh God, let us be uh, unified on this great one thing to make much of you. Thank you. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. If you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verse 4 this morning. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to make a few general observations of our text before we unpack it. And I think it will give us a good Father's Day charge just to look at these observations and then we'll dig into the text. First, I want you to notice how Paul has presented this section on the new relationships and the new covenant of grace that he's laid out in chapters 1 through 3. And in chapter 5, verse 21, Paul says, Let us be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. The whole body of Christ, let us be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Laying ourselves out, serving each other, giving ourselves to each other. And it's all there, the spirit of subservience and doing good to others. And then in that, Paul now will address three sets of relationships. He will address marriage, family, and slaves or employees. And whom does he address first in all three relationships? The one who is to display the submission. And so he starts, wives, be submissive to your husbands. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. And slaves, serve your masters. And so he establishes their submission and their subservience by showing that it's a submission to Christ. All three of them, you submit because you submit to Jesus Christ, who's worthy of all your submission. He establishes that. Then what does he do? He quickly follows it up by turning to the one then who has the authority in the relationship. He commands them to set the climate of the relationship. And so you're to make it easier and natural and compatible for those who are going to come into submission. And so you can abuse this authority. And if you do, you will not be like Jesus Christ who used his authority to set the atmosphere of love and grace in the body of Christ. He's made our submission a glad delight to him. What woman does not want to submit to a man like Jesus Christ, who's trying to love you the way Christ loves the church? What child doesn't want to obey a dad like is going to be described in this passage this morning? What slave doesn't want to give service to a boss like this? And so it's important to catch this structure and not just, my kids, are to obey, my kids are to obey, and I will make them do it if it kills me, if it kills them. I'm just, they're going to obey. I'll, I will make it happen. And I want you fathers to see in verse 4, it begins with and. And. The address to children is not over yet. <clears throat> children, obey your parents in the Lord. Give them honor. There are more inspired words to the parent-child relationship than just that. And a a lot of dads get lost in verses 1 through 3 and act like verse 4 doesn't exist. Verse 4, 1 through 3, children obey and honor. Fathers, create an environment for your children to thrive in this command. We want to provide a climate for your children's success and the command of obedience. I want to set that stage and that aroma to help them in it. How many dads just stop at verse 3? Dads, we, we set the tone and the atmosphere of our home. And that's why we preach Jesus Christ again and again and again in this church. Because that is the atmosphere and the aroma that must be set And so we need to ask, is the aroma of our home harsh? 
controlling? How about pharisaical? One where mistakes are pounded, where there's very little nurture, where they have to earn your love, just standards with no heart. Can't get your attention, so I'll take negative attention if that's what it takes. I want you to hear verse 4, and fathers. Fathers. The second observation I'd like to make is the promise of this verse. As I read before I prayed, when your child was conceived, it was an eternal soul. I just can't tell you what that does to my heart. They're going to live forever. These little ones are going to live forever. And when your child was uh, received, uh, conceived and he was given to you once he's birthed, uh, you gave him your DNA. And you brought forth a sinful child separated from God at conception. Born, twisted because of my inheritance from Adam. And so I, I, I birthed the kid who's off, twisted, and hates God. Good job, Ken. <laughs> These truths are so weighty that they bring in anxiety to me. And I just want you to listen to this verse, though. There is something that you can do to help this eternal, sinful soul that God has birthed into your family. There's grace for your children to be forever adopted into the family of God. That's what Ephesians 1-3 through has told us. There is grace for your child. God saves children. Hallelujah. He uses means. And He uses fathers using means to bring them to Christ. And if you look at an eternal soul that you have passed your deadly poison of sin to, and all you care about is their education, I want them to get to Yale or Harvard. All I care about is how big their house is and that they have a backyard. I just care about their food and that their teeth are straight and I give them braces. I I want them to have a trampoline and they got to be the best at every sport. That's all I care about. I I like when they're the captain and everybody makes a fuss over them and says, oh, it must take after their daddy. Stop. If that's the passion of your soul this morning, I'm just going to ask you to repent before God. You've gotten off so bad if that is the chief end for your kids. It's so much bigger. Take up, men, your God-given responsibility to point these little ones to God. Supplication. Know the gospel. Know the doctrine. Know the storyline of the Bible. Know Christ. Fertilize it with your own holy life and take up your cross and die. Because when you have these kids, your hobbies are just done. Die to this calling to nurture these little ones and set that atmosphere and show them of a Savior who's worthy to lose your life for. Thirdly, my third observation is I want you to notice how brief Paul's teaching is on parenting. He kind of just tells us very simply, (coughs) there's a pattern to be avoided. Quit exasperating your children. And there's a practice to do. Bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Boom, that's it. Don't rule them harshly, but rear them tenderly. One man said, fairness and firmness and fondness is the call to a dad. That's it. Nine verses on husbands. I mean, four to slaves. Three to wives. Three for children. One for dads. Happy Father's Day. (laughs) The hardest thing I've ever taken up is parenting, and Paul gives me one verse. Thanks, Paul. (laughs) Single guy. (laughs) don't forget that this letter was written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this is what God wanted us to have in our parenting, and it's sufficient. And I'll tell you this, this one verse is a gem. But what I want you to have this morning is confidence, men, and the sufficiency of the Word of God. God has given us all that we need for life and godliness. That's what He began in Ephesians 1 Three, every spiritual blessing He has given to us. He's given us all that we need to parent. And surely there's more in the New Testament addressing parenting then, and and I want to tell you there is. Colossians 3.21, Fathers, do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. (laughs) That's it. So what I need then is I need a bunch of seminars. I need books and I need conferences and I need blogs. Some of you just live on blogs all day long and they're making you anxious. (laughs) But I'm going to tell you plainly this morning, 
if this verse is understood in its context, it's enough. And before you leave this morning, do that. We, we've been working through Ephesians in the young marriage community group, and I, my marriage is just blossoming with how to apply Ephesians 1 to marriage. And now it's the same thing uh, to apply Ephesians 1 to, to parenting. It's all so beautiful and clear. And so my observation is it's a small verse, but this book, it's all that we need for parenting. And so what is it that Paul has given us, men? Don't use your authority to provoke your children. Am I creating an adversarial relationship between me and my child? And I'll tell you right now, fear and anxiety will do this. When you are so anxious and you're so afraid, you're going you're gonna to just exasperate your child. They're, they're married. Fear and anxiety and exasperating just go hand in glove. And that's what will happen. It says, don't do that. Do not do that. Secondly, I'm to nurture them. For some, it, it, it's just controlling them. I just control them. That's it. They, I, the, they can never go wrong. They can't fail. If I just control them, I'm safe. And I'll tell you, that is not a safe way of parenting. You're to bring them up, which means to nurture, to bring them up. I, I'm bringing them from parental control to self-control. It's my goal. It's no longer parental control that a little child needs. I'm leading them to self-control to this God of the universe. From looking to me for everything to looking to Christ for everything. There's the goal of parenting. Quit looking to me for everything. Look to Jesus. Learn to look to Him and find the sufficiency of Christ in all things. That's the call of parents, to nurture and establish them in true godliness. And so are you training them to live before the eye of God or the eye of mom or dad? Do your kids fear you more or do they fear God more? Where are you leading them? Where are you training to nurture them up? So don't exasperate, discipline, and nurture these children. And I got one more observation, okay? I'm going to set a record for my longest introduction. We have such an anxiety over their souls because they're eternal souls. And what we do then is we, we gobble up every parenting book and video and manual. And our favorite ones are the legalistic teachers. I love them because they give you a recipe. And if you do them, you get godly children and it releases my anxiety. Thank you for this list. Now I can go do it and I, whew, now my kid will be okay. Our fear causes us to smother and make little idols out of these. It's just every, every time a child is born, they just hand this little child to you and it's instant idolatry. Instant. Instant. And that's the battle. And so uh, I think it was Rick Anderson used the phrase, we have parental paranoia. And so what comes then is we, we love these eternal souls so much. God has made it in eight and then with the spirit within you, there's a love that is unexplainable. But what it produces is parental paranoia because I love them so deeply. And so I live with a constant anxiety that we carry around in regards to our children. I can see it on your faces some Sundays right when you walk in. And it, it just is so heavy and weighty. Your joy is so bound to how your children are doing that day and not in Christ. My, my joy is, how is little Junior doing? And it's not, Jesus Christ in victory, seated at the right hand of God, coming again, promising me glory. My, all my joy is surrendered to these little ones, or the older ones. All of it is bound to parental paranoia. To not let them, this is the call, to not let them dictate our joy in an unchanging Christ for, for the best thing that you could ever give them is that. Give them that. Give them a, a, a dad who's so secure in Christ that they realize, I can't throw dad. I can't flip him when I say those things or go do those things. He'll, 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 he'll confront me, but he's not, his joy is not bound in me. It is not bound up in me. We feel if we do one thing wrong, I see this so often, that they're going to go to hell. Just There's a paranoia. I didn't breastfeed long enough, and studies show that if you don't, you're going you're gonna to ruin your children. My son is not potty trained like the two-month-old uh, down the street. <laughs> A kid has no hope. 
I gave my baby solid foods too early, and now they can't learn as well. He's a thumb sucker, and it teaches self-dependency, and he'll never come to Christ. And the unpardonable sin, I gave him vaccinations. <laughs> How will they enter the kingdom of God? I hope you're getting the picture. I see this daily. Parental paranoia. And so this is my observation. Christian parents especially Reformed ones in my journey, are rarely neglectful. My time of overseeing this flock is very rarely do I find parents who are neglectful of their children. But often this little Greek word, hyper, hooper, uh, it means over, to hyperextend, to go over. And so it becomes an inordinate concern an epithumia. And the fruit of this then, when that happens, is to micromanage. And later in life, when, when this control should be becoming influence, we control more. And then we grab it even more and it increases and we're over worrying about our children. I want you to hear this. It's as sinful as ignoring them. It's just as wrong to, to do that as it is to ignore them. And so maybe some this morning, you just need to be set free in the gospel by the parental paranoia uh, for your children. And uh, this is not biting your nails all the time and living under this constant squeezing. If I do something wrong with my kids, I'm going to ruin them. It's truly a lack of faith in the goodness and grace of our God with your children. We have to parent by faith, diligent but dependent. And we must live by faith that my joy is in Christ and it's not in my children. We raise them by faith. And you see, biblical parent is, parenting is not just doing the right things, but it's doing them with a pervasive confidence in the promises and power and goodness of God in respect to the children that he's given to you. It's, it's a confidence and faith. Seek the grace of God to do your best. To be faithful, even when you sin, you deal with it God's way with a confidence in the sufficiency of the Word of God and the goodness of God. Uh, God's glory is to save. There's, there's no verse that demands it. I just want you to know that I get election. But God's glory and delight is to be a saving God. When He showed Moses His glory, that, that is it. I'll, I'll have compassion upon Him. I have compassion. He's a glorious God. Parenting is not a paint-by-number process. It's faith in God. And I'll tell you now, you must Trust God. We don't parent in an anxious tension, but in a glad confidence in God. There's a big difference. Not doing nothing, but doing it joyfully and gladly in the Lord. Aren't you glad I made all those observations? <laughs> those have been life-changing uh, for my own heart. Well, shall we go to the text? Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so our first point is the holy responsibility of a Christian father begins with a clear understanding of the role that God then has assigned to him. And so I don't want you to miss these two words, and fathers. Did you think Paul forgot the Greek word for parents? <laughs> he used it in verse 1. I think he knew what the word was. Did he forget moms? <laughs> Doesn't Paul know that I go to work all day and my mom, moms are home training them all day long. They're with them 24-7. I go earn the money. I keep the outside of the house. I can't take this on too. And fathers. Fathers are the chief influence of the home on the children. This is your biblical mandate. Fathers. Young men who want to get married, hear this. Fathers. Fathers. God has made it so that the father's influence is chief upon the home. The mother is such a blessing. She gives all of her gifts to this family to be used in the godly training of her children. Praise God for mothers. She's the queen of the house. She's to be obeyed and honored children. She is a crucial part in the process. But this morning and fathers... You are, not, you are to be the most influential influence in the house. 
You are the leader in this task, raising the next generation in righteousness. You can't shrug it off. You can't give it to someone else. And fathers, you are to set the climate of this home. You are the heads. And, and you, you, you like that title when your wife has to submit to you, don't you, man? <laughs> Do you like it when you're the one responsible for the physical, emotional, and spiritual welfare of your home? This is the men's call. You must set the climate of your homes, men. And this generation is teaching us to be wimps, spiritual wimps, and not take this mantle and do what God has called us to do. Paul has labored hard in this epistle to show us what that climate must be. This verse is not in isolation, but it's the application of a clear flow and thought that Paul has been teaching. And so you can't pull this verse out now and write books on this verse and look at every nuance and do word studies and say, this is the role of a father. You'll miss it. We have to flow through this whole epistle if we're going to understand the doctrine and get it and believe it and live upon it. That we live lives worthy of the calling, Paul says, that we have received. It's out of that. So you live out of Ephesians. You, you understand it. You believe it. You get it. And 6.4 is automatic, dads. Skip it. And 6.4 will become another tablet of stone and that, that will command but not empower you to keep it. You'll get your rules. You'll be convicted of it. You'll work at it. You'll fall back. You'll do it again. I'm telling you now, as Ephesians 1-5 it will make this flow by the Spirit of God. Before he gives the command, what does he say? Be filled with the Spirit. And this will come from these truths, and it will make you this kind of man to lead and to guide. You can't go back to Moses for your parenting. Give me the list and the commands. I will make myself and my kids keep them. I will not exasperate them. I'll nurture them. I'll discipline them. I'm going to put it up on the refrigerator, and I'll keep it. And what will happen is your home is going to smell like Mount Sinai instead of Mount Zion, where his commandments are not burdensome and my yoke is easy and my burden is light because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So then, what kind of a man must we be uh, to keep Ephesians 6, 4? What must be the climate of our home then? <clears throat> and I preached this a while back and I'm just going to uh, lay them out real quick because I, I want to focus on one thing this morning. First, as Paul said, it must be grace in chapter 1. Just someone who understands the gospel of grace, and it's just the atmosphere of the home is just grace. Then Paul says that we need to be devoted to the local body. Uh, a, a good dad is given to the body of Christ, looking at people's warts, forgiving people, forbearing, not the guy who pops around to church after church every time he gets hurt and just keeps moving around. You get in and you show these kids an ability to forgive, forbear, and get in the body of Christ and keep the unity of the Spirit. And then he says it should be that of love. Love should characterize these homes. And then he says, men, you need to be pure in chapter 5. You need to be filled with the Spirit. And you need to be men who love your wife like Christ loved the church. I don't think you could ever be a better parent than when those kids realize how much you love their mom and they watch it on a daily basis. And then Paul says you need to stand under the attack of the devil and put on the armor of God in this battle. That's the aroma of the home. But what I want to do with our brief time is I want to remind you of the theme of Ephesians, the chief climate to your home and the big picture atmosphere. Uh, this is so empowering. I want you to flip to Ephesians 3.8. <clears throat> we'll look at two verses and then I'll, I'll make our application. Look at Ephesians 3.8. Paul's talking about his calling. And he says to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, and this is his calling, to preach the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. I get to preach the unfathomable riches of Jesus Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. I'm going to bring out the mystery of Jesus Christ. And he says, so that, here's the purpose, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This is in accordance with his eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus. So now he says, uh, manifold wisdom as the church is to show the beauty of this oneness 
that now comes with Jew and Gentile and the gospel and we're all brought together as one and, and the whole world is falling apart and decaying since we've been brought out from under God. And now in the gospel, we come back under the lordship of Christ. And before that, everything's disintegrating. Everything in this world is falling apart everywhere you look. And when you come under the lordship of Christ, he begins healing and rightness and transforming and changing. And there's unity and oneness from people from all walks of life in this one place called the, the church. And so what it shows the world is they're trying to find peace everywhere. Just visualize world peace, nothing's working. And, and so there's this manifold wisdom of God that the world looks into this church and says, man, that's it. This is what happens when people come under the rule and reign of Christ. They love each other. They love the lost. They care about people. And they just look at it and they say, that's what heaven is going to be. You get a little foreshadow by looking at the body of Christ and you see the manifold wisdom of God of what he's doing in this mystery of Jesus Christ. Now flip over to chapter 1, verse 8. He's preaching, he's talking about the redemption that's in Christ. In verse 8, the riches of his grace which he lavished on us and all of God's wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, Christ, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon uh, the, the earth. So the, the, uh, history is going to climax with the summing up of everything in Jesus Christ. Everything is going to find its meaning. Everything is going to come under and be in perfect subjection, rule and reign, and all harmony will be brought back into this beautiful design that God has. And so... He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Paul shows us these blessings. He says he's lavished them on us. He traces salvation. He goes back, back, back. He gets to eternity past, and he goes into the very heart of God. And what he finds in that heart is in love, he predestined us to the adoption as sons to be holy and blameless before him. Then he traces the outworking of it in time that Jesus came and redeemed so that he could bring sinners into this blessing. Then he gives you a, an engagement ring, the Holy Spirit, to guarantee that you're going to be brought to the great wedding feast to enjoy Christ forever. So when you get an engagement ring, it means I'm serious, you're mine, nothing can break it. And Jesus has given you the Holy Spirit as, a, as an engagement ring so that you live in the fullness, enjoying, waiting for the final culmination of all things in Christ where they're summed up. And so he, he says it'll all come and that'll be the climax. And so the fall has broken unity between God and man, man and man, man and creation. It's all broken. In Christ, everything is working right again in unity. And so the church, he says, is a picture of the manifold wisdom of God to put on display the oneness and the unity that comes in Christ. So flip over to Ephesians 4, and I'll, this is our last verse. So after he lays out the gospel in verse 1, therefore, what is it therefore? In light of the gospel of grace. I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walk worthy of this gospel. Well, what does that look like? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance for one another, in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So Paul's first application of, of all uh, the longest section in Ephesians over marriage and parenting and everything is that we preserve the unity of the Spirit now, that we, we show the world what happens in Christ and our oneness and our unity where, where the world can't find this. And they're, they're to find it here. And Paul's very diligent to give you a command. You better be diligent with all effort to preserve this unity. And we live in a day and age where everyone just mouths off and throws out careless words and slanders. And it's just, he's saying, you better be diligent to preserve this beautiful unity because you know what? It's bigger than you. This is what puts on, on, on display the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so we, we are a people that are, we forbear and we're humble and we're gentle and we love and we show this is what happens when you're one in Christ. And so here is the glory and the beauty. And so we put that on display. And so it's just, it's so much bigger than a personal salvation. And I want you to hear this. It's bigger than your personal marriage. 
It's bigger than your personal family. That's so myoptic. It breaks down God's design for the kingdom and how God will advance it through this whole plan of His, which is why we live, move, and exist. He gave us the great commission, not the great family. And and great families enter into the great commission and this whole picture of what God is doing. Here's our call. So pull away from God's purpose in marriage and family to put on display this unity and glory and say, oh, it's just for me. It's just for my little family. You've taken a light and you put it under a bushel. You broke down the whole plan of God that what he's doing from eternity past to eternity future. It isn't just my little family that I hide away and keep protected from this world. You break the whole design that God has for it. From 30 years in ministry, everybody I've ever seen do this has ended with a broken heart. It's not God's chief end. The chief end is to sum up everything in Jesus Christ that everything would find its fullness in that. And the ones who get that, the blessing that has flowed is abundant and eternal and makes glad the hearts of the people of God. So fathers, are you fulfilling what God has called you to in the big picture of what God is doing in this universe? Or have you narrowed it down to your little kingdom, your little family, pulled out of the church, all of its fullness, I can't tell you what the church has done for my family. And to shine this beautiful picture on the summing up of all things in Christ to a world that needs to be healed and under Christ. They need to see our families. They need to see us unified, that they would come under this Christ and be healed. So exhibit A, my family. Let that give life to you and your family this morning. Come into it, see it, love it, find it. Enter into the big picture and find the fullness of joy in that. So men, seek the lordship of Christ. Come under him. Get in his word. Learn what God is doing in this universe. Get a mentor who's walked in this. We can start up our men's gathering and our women's gathering and community groups. Just go find someone. Get in one. And find someone to mentor in you these things and to disciple you in them. And this is going to be so important that we don't lose this big picture of what the design is. And so I'm going to close out with my other favorite quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones, who I think captured well. He said, what we have to do is to make Christianity attractive as parents. We should give our children the impression that the most wonderful thing in the world is Christianity. And that there is nothing else in life that's comparable to being a Christian We should create in them the desire to be like us. They see us and they see the joy that we have in it and the way that we wonder and marvel at this great God. And they should be saying to themselves, I'm longing to be as old as them so that I can enjoy it as much as they obviously do. Our method must never be mechanical, legal, or repressive. Our testimony must never be forced. But in all we are, say, and do... Let them know that we ourselves are bond slaves of Jesus Christ and that God in his grace has opened our eyes and awakened us to the most glorious things in the world and that our greatest desire for them is that they may enter into the same knowledge and have the same joy and have the highest privilege possible in this world. That is serving the Lord and living to the praise of the glory of his grace. I just want to put that on display. I'm going to close. I just want to say a couple things as I close in prayer. This is not a call for a perfect dad, okay? But a dad who lives in grace and seeks the perfect dad. So I want to make sure that this is not a call to be perfect. It's a call to be a sinner who lives in grace and keeps seeking the God of grace. Anyone in here blow it as bad as I did? Raise your hand if you haven't. Well, raise your hand if you haven't blown it. Sorry, guys, that was a setup. Okay, if you did, I'd, I'd like you to leave if you raise, raise your hand. Is humility in, in 4.1. Uh, so I want you to hear this. Grace is to repent and start again. No matter how old your kids are, no matter where it is, to repent before God and say, God, will you let me start again and set this atmosphere in our home? It's never too late. God is the God of new beginnings. He's not looking for perfect men. But he, it's, it's men who look to a perfect Savior. And so let, let's model and seek that. If your kids are grown, 
Teach me. Teach me how to show grace to my estranged kids. I've, I've watched one family in here that, that uh, have done such a good job of winning back all their estranged children because of law and now going back at it with grace. If you've lost a child this morning, I just want you to know we care about your pain this morning. It was brave to even come to church with that pain. We have a couple families who have lost children to suicide. And uh, and there's just so many things you wish you knew or could have done different. And I just, my heart breaks for you and I invite you to come here and be healed and not be judged. We'll do everything we can. We're going to be clumsy to try and help and try not to say stupid things and just love you and help you through that. God, give us a wisdom to just know how to love these people. Parenting is hard. And one comfort I have is I wish I could have a redo in so many areas. But God uses our mistakes and the things that we do well for his glory. He'll use, he'll use both. And so I want you to just hear the story's not over yet. And when it's all summed up in Christ, every detail will make sense and, and we'll worship him and we won't question or doubt anything of his perfect wisdom and how he unfolded that. I want you to make that your hope. And lastly, if you've lost a dad, I know some in here that have lost him at a very young age and some just recent. And God says he's a father to the fatherless. And I just have such a heart for orphans. And I just want you to know there's so many spiritual dads in this church who would love to to help you and journey and be there for you in this. We have many men in this church who will be a spiritual father to help you journey to heaven. And so men, look for these orphans. I don't care how old they are. Bring them into your families and love them and help them. There's just so much hurt and loss. And so I want us all to join hands and help each other journey to glory. And just a call this morning to to be faithful. And so what I'd I'd like as I'm going to close in prayer is is anyone who's a dad or, or was a dad, if you would just stand, I'd like to pray over you this morning. What a high calling. What a high calling, man. Let's all who who are seated, let's pray for them. Go to the throne of grace. Father, I thank you for these men. I thank you how I've watched so many of them labor with their children. Some have eaten some sweet fruits and some sit here with such a sword in their heart. God, I pray for comfort and peace for these men. I've watched the, the diligence, Lord, as we, we all look back and we, we, would be as, we were as faithful to what we knew in parenting and, and we'd all like a redo. And so God, thank you. I pray just uh, pour out grace upon these men and, and help them to continue to parent young children and parent old children. God, be with them, enable them, help us to set the aroma of grace and be humble and forbearing and kind and go after them and take these little ones and give them safe homes where they're not exasperated, but they're disciplined and nurtured in the Lord. And the whole aroma is the summing up of all things in Jesus Christ. God, let that overflow us. Let our kids just say, man, they love Christ. Let that be such a, not an act, but just what we are, who we are, what we find in these scriptures and you. God, just empower these men. Reveal yourself to them. Fill them with your spirit so that they can do these high callings that you have given to them. God, pour out abundant grace upon these men, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.